CloudDB, shaping your new normal. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 APAC OCI Days by Apaco UC. This is our first year having a dedicated OCI event, and it's our honor and privilege to run this event with the support of 15 Oracle user groups and Java user groups in the Asia-Pac region. Please remember to register to as many sessions as you can. This way you will be able to have access to our replays until June 15, 2022. I would like to say thanks to our Oracle user groups and Java user groups that made this event possible, and also to our sponsors, the Oracle Ace community, the DevRel team, and your many sponsors, Oracle Corporation and CloudDB. Now for today's session, Automation of Software Engineering with OCI DevOps, Build and Deployment Pipelines by Lucas Gilema. Please feel free to ask questions at any time by using the chat window in your right lower corner of the screen. And you, uh, Lucas will be answering our questions by the end of the presentation. Also for the people in the user groups watching through the streaming by Facebook, your uh, um, user group coordinator will be collecting our questions and will let me know if you have any questions by chat too. Now, without any other further ado, I want to leave you with this amazing session by Lucas Gilema. Lucas, the room is yours. Thank you, Francisco. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm coming to you from my son's bedroom in the Netherlands. And I'm not sure where you are all located, but it's probably quite a long way from here. Um, world is a small place, isn't it? And Oracle Cloud is one of the many mechanisms that's making it even smaller. Anything that's available to me is available to, to you as well. Um, in that same infrastructure, that same Oracle Cloud infrastructure. So today's topic is automation and automation probably is already part of your day job uh, or it's something that you're thinking about making part of your day jobs. Um, it should be. Uh, automation is one of the ways in which we can improve quality and increase agility and flexibility. Uh, and probably also allow more people without very specific skills to participate in the whole process of software engineering. And the automation um, of software engineering, specific tasks within software engineering, building and deploying applications and making them run on Oracle Cloud infrastructure, uh, that's supported by a fairly new Oracle Cloud service, the OCI DevOps service. And that's my topic for today. Very briefly about myself, my name is Lucas Jellema. Uh, I live in the Netherlands. I work for a company called Amis, that's part of a bigger company called Conclusion. And I'm a, an architect, cloud solution architect, solution architect, integration architect, whatever you like to call it. But I try to think about a big question and turn it into some smaller actions or smaller questions, perhaps as a first step. Uh, here are some of my contact details. And if you would like, uh, to approach me with any question, please feel free to do so. So the specific topics for today, the main ones are deployment and build, and these are supported by this new OCI DevOps service. And other topics uh, that we'll talk about are source code and artifacts. And for both these areas, Oracle has introduced uh, new services as well, and we'll address them. So let's start with deployment. And what even is deployment? Well, putting it very simply, it's, uh, it's a process that as, it, as its outcome has a running software product. Something is running typically in a production environment and it does what it is supposed to do. It generates business value, it supports users uh, and it does so in the designated target environment. And for any service that supports automated deployment, we have a number of requirements. So we want to use a mechanism that has been proven because we don't want to experiment with our deployments. They are almost the most important thing that we do. Uh, any software application that never gets deployed is completely valueless, completely worthless because it doesn't get used. Uh, and if deployment fails or cannot be done, then, well, we have nothing really 
uh, we would like the deployment to be fully without human involvement. So it can take place at any time uh, during the day, the night, the week, uh, but also because we then don't inter uh, introduce any room for human errors. We humans tend to make mistakes, even if we are completely convinced that we don't. That's probably our biggest mistake. And uh, we want the deployment to um, take place in a secure way. And we don't want to have to assign uh, uh, more privileges than we really have to, especially on a production environment, in order to be able to perform deployment. And this is one of the big, uh, one of the biggest benefits, perhaps, of the OCI DevOps deployment pipelines. Now, the deployment needs to be triggerable. And there sh should be an, uh, an an automated mechanism that allows us to kick off a deployment at any time uh, of day or night. And the deployment of a specific artifact, specific application should be tailored to the environment. So if we deploy an application to a test environment or an acceptance environment, then the result is different than when we deploy the same application to the production environment, or at least it should be different. So the deployment mechanism should support this as well. And we would like to have an audit trail. So we know when deployment took place, who was involved, what exactly happened. Well, the OCI DevOps deployment pipelines, um, fulfill these re requirements. So they do all the things that I just said we would like them to do, which is good, of course. Um, basically, OCI DevOps deployment pipelines take care of automated deployment of software artifacts to three specific OCI services, three specific OCI runtime platforms. Uh, the most obvious one is the compute instance, typically a VM, could be a bare metal instance as well. Uh, the second platform, also quite obvious, uh, is the Oracle Kubernetes engine. Uh, and there we deploy container images and make Kubernetes artifacts come to life and run the application. And the third platform to which we can deploy using the deployment pipelines is the OCI functions service, where we have serverless functions. And in this case, a function container image, which is also a container image, but then one specifically recognized by the OCI functions framework, gets deployed to a functions application. A deployment pipeline runs inside of OCI. So it's not like you're running Jenkins on your own environment or on a cloud environment or GitHub Actions um, in the GitHub environment instead of inside OCI. Now the deployment pipeline runs itself inside of OCI and we don't re really even need to know where it runs uh, except for the fact that it's completely integrated uh, with all the other components and services in OCI. And it runs as a resource principle. This basically means that a deployment pipeline through its membership of, of a dynamic group can be assigned privileges. So we can tell OCI that our deployment pipeline has the privilege to run scripts on a specific compute instance or to deploy functions to a specific function application. We don't have to grant this permission to, uh, to any human user. We grant it to the pipeline. And then we grant someone or something the privilege to run the de deployment pipeline. So, in effect, anyone that, uh, who is allowed to run the pipeline can cause the application to be deployed on the, on the compute instance, but they don't themselves have access to the compute in instance. They don't need network level access and they don't need uh, permissions uh, from IAM either. So this is quite, uh, quite important. This is why running deployments inside OCI using OCI DevOps is so attractive. Well, what a deployment pipeline typically starts out by doing is retrieving an artifact. An artifact that's typically the result of a build process. And we'll talk about build in a little while. This artifact is retrieved from the container image registry where the container images are stored. And that's um, compliant with the Docker registry model 
or from a generic artifact registry, a repository with artifacts, and artifacts are just files. They can be any file. Um, they will frequently be uh, jar files or zip files or some other kind of archive file uh, that uh, packages the uh, constituents of an application. Well, the deployment pipelines are simple to trigger. We'll see in a, while, in a little while that they can be triggered from a build pipeline. So when the build is done, the deployment can automatically be triggered. But they can also be triggered uh, through the console, uh, through the API, through the command line interface, uh, in all the ways that are familiar to you on OCI. A deployment pipeline can also uh, make OCI function calls. And these calls can be made, for example, to prepare the environment before deployment takes place, or to perform a check, a smoke test, after deployment has been performed to verify whether deployment is successful. And the component that's now supposed to be running on the deployment environment is indeed running correctly. So, a deployment pipeline can also have manual approval steps. So before a deployment continues to the next stage, a human has to um, approve that that uh, is allowed um, because of certain checks in the previous stage, or at least it's, it's, uh, it's, it seems obvious that checking the results of a, of, a, of a previous stage can lead to the approval. A deployment pipeline also can be triggered from a Jenkins pipeline. So many organizations today uh, run their CI, CD environment, their, uh, their builds in an automated fashion using Jenkins, and there is a Jenkins plugin available from OCI DevOps and that, uh, that allows you to easily set up the trigger deployment step in your Jenkins pipeline, uh, triggering a specific deployment pipeline in your OCI uh, compartment and your tenancy. The deployment pipeline supports blue-green and also canary deployment strategies, and then it works together with a load balancer to ensure that the proper amount of load at the proper moment is shifted uh, to, the new, uh, to the newly deployed environment and perhaps is shifted back when for some reason the deployment turns out to be not completely correct. The deployment pipeline, and it goes for all of OCI DevOps, is OCI native. So it fully integrates with the OCI framework and leverages all the generic facilities such as logging and events and the audit trail, and also access through CLI, API, and console. Best of all, well, maybe not best of all, but certainly uh, nice to know the deployment pipelines are free. So you don't pay anything for running a deployment pipeline. Now we zoom in a little bit to deploying on a compute instance, on a VM or a bare metal instance. Uh, using an OCI deployment pipeline. So the steps here are basically the same as discussed before, but now with a little bit more detail. So artifacts are retrieved from the artifact repository and they are copied to the VM. So that's the first step that the deployment pipeline will take care of. And then uh, on the VM, a number of shell commands will be executed. And these are executed by the cloud agent that's running on each VM in Oracle Cloud. So you don't have to do anything to get the agent uh, installed in your VM. That's part of the provisioning process of the VM. You may have to make sure that the right plugins of the cloud agent are enabled. Um, yeah, let's, let's not go uh, into detail. And then the deployment pipeline carries out the deployment configuration. And that's a script that you have to write. And in this script, you describe the steps that should be executed. And these steps are typically steps like unzip the zip file, copy the files to a specific location, start a service, open up a, uh, a port in the firewall, uh, the normal steps that you would go through when you install an application uh, in a runtime environment. Um, you can use parameters, so you can define parameters on the pipeline. And these parameters are used in expressions 
in the deployment configuration, so in the steps that are uh, to be carried out, um, the shell commands that are to be ex are to be executed by the agent on the VM. Uh, in these commands, you can refer to um, the parameters that are defined on the pipeline. And in this way, by using different values for the for the for the parameters. When the pipeline is run for one environment or for another environment, we take care of making sure that a deployment is tailor uh, tailor made for a specific environment. Now we have to take care of the IAM policies that are required. Um, the deployment pipeline has to be member of a dynamic group. And this dynamic group has to be granted through a policy uh, the permission to manage the instance agent command family. Um, this is just, well, when, when you get around to, to using the deployment pipeline, this is, this is easy enough to take care of. All right. Let's go through a specific example. So we have an existing web application that's packaged as a zip file. Uh, the zip file is called myserver.zip and this, uh, this is an artifact in our gen uh, generic artifact registry. It contains a binary executable which is compiled from a Go source. But that doesn't really, uh, really matter at this point. It's just a binary executable and a number of static web resources, HTML files, uh, JavaScript files, images, etc. There's also already an existing deployment pipeline, which I will show you in a moment. Now the steps we, we will go through in the demo, we will go to the artifact registry, download the artifact, change it a little, and then upload it again and create a new version of the artifact. Then I'll create a new compute instance, an Oracle Linux VM, and then I will target the deployment pipeline that already exists to this new VM. So the deployment pipeline, when it's run, will deploy the artifact onto that specific VM. Then we will run the deployment pipeline. And at the time of running, we set a parameter to make sure that it refers to the right version of the artifact. Well, let's just go through it. So here is the artifact registry. This is in the OCI Cloud Console. Uh, it's a fairly new service uh, introduced I think last summer, uh, July 2021. And the artifact registry is organized in repositories and each, re uh, each repository um, is used typically uh, for a specific project or there could also be repositories that are used across projects and it contains artifacts. And as I said before, artifacts are just files. In this case, there's this file, myserver.zip version 4.9 and we download it. And on the top of this page, you see the contents of the file. Oh, it's 4.8, sorry, it's 4.8. Um, it contains an index.html and also a JSON file and some other static files, I think, that are not shown here. And I open locally the uh, index.html file and I add a line. So uh, I, I've added the line, uh, which will be shown in bold, updated for APEC OCI days 2022. I create a new zip file, um, which contains this updated index.html. Uh, and I locally now have a zip file that's called myserver49 APEC OCI days.zip. So it's changed artifact, not yet deployed. It's just local on my laptop. Then I upload this new artifact version. I add it to the artifact registry in this same repository. And in addition to the version 4.8 that already existed, there now also is a 4.9. That's the new one that's not yet deployed anywhere. And then I create a new compute instance. So this is again the OCI console, and this is uh, where I can create an instance. Uh, and it's an instance, and I give the instance a name. It's specifically for the demo for the event that we are now all part of. Uh, I accept all the defaults, almost all the defaults. I want to assign a public IP address because I want to access this simple um, web application once it has been deployed. And I don't need any SSH keys. I don't have to contact the VM. The deployment pipeline will interact with, with the VM 
or actually the agent running on the VM will interact with the deployment pipeline. Um, but at least I don't have to be able to go to the compute instance myself. So no SSH keys, which means one attack service less. The instance is being provisioned and after a few seconds, the instance is running and has been assigned an IP address. Now you also see here a number of tabs and one of the tabs is the Oracle Cloud Agent. And we won't be looking at the tab right now, but if you go into, uh, into the tab, you will see the different plugins um, that are enabled or disabled for the Oracle Cloud Agent. And there is one that needs to be enabled in order to be able to run commands on the VM. And we need that plugin to be enabled because that's what the deployment pipeline leverages in order to perform the deployment on the VM. So now I have to create in the DevOps project. So that's the OSI DevOps service in a project context. I have deployment pipelines and build pipelines, as we'll see in a moment. I also have something called environment. And an uh, environment is like a logical placeholder for a specific environment. And an environment can be an OP, OPE cluster or a function application or a function in a function application or an instance. And it says here instance group because multiple instances can be in an instance group, but in this case, there will be only one instance, one VM. And I select the VM. Uh, again, there could be multiple onto which I will deploy the application in one go of the deployment pipeline, but there, there needs to be only one in this case, the new one. And I've now created the environment. And now I'm looking at the existing deployment pipeline. So in this case, it's a fairly simple deployment pipeline. It has just a, a single stage, which uh, deploys on a compute instance. So there's no function call. There's no human approval step. It's just deploy. It's as simple as that. And I've set the right environment. So now the deployment pipeline will deploy to this environment, which stands for the VM, the new VM. And I've also specified the artifact to deploy. And the artifact, as you can see at the bottom of the page, it's my server.zip and it has a version, but I haven't specified exactly which version. Instead, I've used an expression. It's a placeholder expression that uses a parameter. And we'll see the parameter in a little while. Now, I've also, sp also specified the deployment configuration, which is in the middle of the page. Uh, and the de uh, deployment configuration is a YAML file that describes the steps that have to be performed on the VM. So that's where it says, and I'll, I'll show you this in a moment, that's where it says unzip um, the archive and copy the files to a certain location. Now the version of the artifact, as I said, is, a, is defined through an expression, and this expression refers to a parameter. The parameter is defined on the pipeline, and its default value, as you can see right now, is 4.8. But when I run the deployment pipeline, I will say in this case, the parameter value should be 4.9 because I want to deploy the new version of the artifact, the new version of the web application. There we go. So now I'm going to run the pipeline and I'm going to provide a value of 4.9. Now here's the, uh, the, the deployment specification. That's the YAML file I mentioned that contains the instructions of what exactly should be uh, should be done on the target environment. And here are just um, two steps highlighted. One step is where um, I'm, I'm copying all the files that have been as extracted from the artifact. So, um, and these, fi uh, the, these files are, are, are copied to a specific directory um, on, uh, on, uh, on the VM. So in this case, it's a directory uh, slash TMP slash your server. And then the second step that's highlighted is where I run the application, uh, which means it will, uh, it will start uh, listening for HTTP requests. So this is what you'll get when the deployment pipeline has run. Uh, on the far right, a full logging of all the steps that have been performed. And if, uh, if everything went uh, according to plan, then we don't really need logging. But of course, if something fails, then we use the logging to find out what exactly failed. 
And after deployment has been completed, the artifact has been deployed, the application is running. Um, to be honest, I also uh, needed to, uh, to define uh, a network security rule to allow uh, ingress traffic for port uh, 8085. So that's a step up. I haven't shown, but that's a step that I needed to take. And here we have the result, and it was acquired completely uh, automatically. After creating the new version of the artifact, the only thing I did was run the deployment pipeline, specify that I wanted to, to deploy version 4.9 of the artifact instead of 4.8. And from that, uh, from that point on, the version VM has been um, uh, has been extended with the new version of my application. So this is what you have seen in action. Um, artifact retrieved from the generic artifact registry uh, and deployed to the environment um, of the VM. Now we add the build pipeline. The build pipeline creates artifacts that can be stored either in the generic artifact registry or in the container image registry. And the build pipeline also can trigger the deployment pipeline. So that can be the outcome of the build pipeline. The build pipeline typically contains a managed build stage that uses a build server VM. And that's an environment that you don't have to manage yourself. It's, uh, it's an environment completely managed by Oracle. And you run your build pipeline, you get a build server assigned. And on that build server, all your commands will be executed. But a build pipeline uses source code. And this source code can come either from an OCI code repository, which is a fairly new thing in OCI, also introduced this summer. Uh, it's a Git repository, and it's completely managed by Oracle, and it's part of the Oracle Cloud infrastructure environment. But you can also get your sources from other types of repositories, like GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket. Now, a developer will, uh, will typically work locally, uh, creating sources, updating sources, and at some point committing these sources and pushing the sources to the code repository, which can be either of these four repositories. And when that has been done, an event can be triggered to automatically start the build pipeline. But it doesn't need to happen on every commit, but it could happen on specific events against the code repository. Uh, you can also manually trigger the build pipeline, by the way. And the build pipeline retrieves the sources, uh, copies the sources to the build server, performs the steps that need to be performed, more on that in a moment, and the products uh, of that build, uh, build server process can then be published to the generic artifact registry or the container image registry. And then the build stage can also trigger a deployment pipeline. You don't have to, but you can. As I said, you can also manually trigger the build pipeline. So very, very briefly, the container image registry. This is a service that has been available on OCI for at least two, maybe three years. Uh, it contains container images. And these container, uh, container images uh, are tagged typically, and the tag usually indicates a version. Um, uh, the images can be public or private. If they are public, anyone can retrieve them from the container image registry. If they are private, then you need specific permissions, obviously. Uh, container images can be published uh, by the build pipeline, and they can be read by a deployment pipeline. You can also publish and, uh, and read using other tools, by the way, but that's outside the scope of today's presentation. Now, then this new uh, generic artifact registry, new as in summer 2021. Um, it contains files. The files can be uploaded and downloaded through the OCI console, but they can also be published by a build pipeline and the artifacts can be used by a deployment pipeline. But again, you can also use them and publish them through the OCI CLI, the API or the other uh, channels available to us. Then the code repository also introduced last summer. It's a fully managed Git repository, a little bit like GitHub, but far simpler in its functionality. Uh, it's fully compatible with uh, any Git client, 
Um, it could also be a mirror from an external repository. So you can say, uh, I have this external repository either on GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket, and I want the code repository inside OCI to be a full mirror. Uh, and there can be several reasons. And one of the reasons is that if you have all your sources copied, then the build process will, uh, will be much faster because the sources don't have to be retrieved from a, re uh, a remote repository, uh, if that even is available at, at that point. Using a code repository is free except for the storage costs. So you pay for storing the volume of data that's, part, that, that's in your repository. The OCI console has a UI for accessing the code repository. It, it's fairly simple. It's nowhere near as rich as a typical Git client tool or the GitHub web UI. Let's now focus on the build process. So our objective is to produce deployable artifacts. Well, usually that's the objective of a build process. However, a build process can be any process. It can be anything that you want to run automatically on a build server. And if in, uh, uh, as part of your build job, you create OCI cloud resources or you send emails, then that's fine too. There's, uh, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. But the typical objective, of course, is to produce a deployable artifact, and that's usually a container image um, or a zip, jar, tar, var, uh, ear file. As part of the build pipeline, you typically will also perform linting, code QA, testing, as well as packaging uh, the code. Some requirements on a build pipeline service, and of course these re requirements are very similar to the ones we had before for the deployment pipeline. Uh, the build process should be fully automated. It should easily be re re repeatable. The mechanism should be proven. It should be triggerable from source code events, such as a merge of two branches or of one branch to, uh, to another branch or specific commits. It should be easy for a software developer to work with. It should be fully integrated in OCI. Uh, it should be cheap. Ideally, it should be free. And there should be plenty of build server capacity. So the build server itself should be rich enough to perform the builds that we need. And there should be enough VM uh, capacity available to run the build whenever we need it to run, which with some services, to be honest, is a bit of a challenge. <laughs> Now, for the moment, there's only one build server image available to us. Um, it's, a, it's a fine image. It's, it's uh, fairly generous in size. Uh, it comes with a number of pre-installed tools, perhaps not always the right versions of these tools. Uh, at this moment, you cannot define your own custom build server image. And that will be an option in the service in the near future. But uh, for now, we have to work with the build server uh, that Oracle has uh, made available to us. Of course, the build server itself can easily reach out to the public internet and install all the tools and images and versions uh, and uh, get, get repositories that you need in order to perform your build process. Acquiring a build server um, can, can be fairly fast, can take quite some time, uh, depends on availability in your region, I guess, and also um, how busy it is at a, at a certain moment in time. Um, for me, I think it has never taken more than up to 20 or 30 seconds in order to, uh, to, to get hold of a build server. The entire build process, I don't think it ever took less than one, uh, one and a half minutes. It usually does not take longer than three minutes, but of course that depends on exactly what the steps are uh, in your build process. So a build pipeline uh, can consist of multiple stages that can run sequentially or in parallel. Uh, the most important stage probably is the managed build. So that's where the actions of the build server take place. There's also a stage of type deliver artifact. That's where you publish your files to the artifact registry or your container image to the container image registry. There's a stage that can trigger a deployment pipeline. And there's a stage that does nothing but wait. Uh, if you know that a certain step that you have put in motion will take 
at least 30 seconds, then you will include a, uh, a wait step of maybe one minute in your build pipeline. And then the build pipeline after that wait can continue. It doesn't really make sense to have a wait as a last step in your build pipeline, but that's another discussion. So build pipeline can be triggered by events in the source code repository, by a human action or by an API call. And the build pipelines also are parameterized. So you can define specific parameters that can be used in the build script. And that also can be uh, used when the artifacts are published. So you can specify which version of an artifact should be published. And there are, uh, the, these parameter values are also passed to any deployment pipelines that you trigger. So you can specify, I want to publish an artifact version X, and then the deployment pipeline is also told that it has to deploy version X, that same version X that the build process has delivered. So the managed build stage, it uh, starts by retrieving sources uh, that you have specified uh, in the build pipeline. Uh, then it will perform the steps that are defined in the build specification YAML file. And that YAML file is part of the code repository. So as part of your application source code, there's one extra file, uh, and that's the build specification YAML file that contains the steps that the build server uh, will perform on the uh, build server VM. You specify in a managed build uh, stage definition which files uh, that uh, are on the build server after the build is complete, uh, which files are the products of the build process and should be published to uh, an artifact registry. As I mentioned, we can define uh, build, line, uh, build pipeline parameters. We can also have the value of these parameters retrieved from the vault uh, as a secret from the vault. So if your build, for example, requires connection details, credentials, or anything else that's sensitive, you don't have to specify it in the build pipeline, but you can retrieve it from a secret uh, in the key vault. The build pipeline, just like the deployment pipeline, runs under resource principle authentication. So that means that you can specify the permissions it requires. You don't have to grant these permissions to any human user but you grant them only to the build pipeline. And then the build, uh, when the build pipeline is run, it can use these permissions um, to perform actions against OCI resources, such as running commands using OCI CLI or invoking functions. So let's go through a very quick demo. We don't have a lot of time left. Um, what we're going to do here is there's a source code and I'm going to commit the source code and push the source code to an OCI code repository. And then the build pipeline is triggered. We define a parameter for the artifact version that is to be created, published, and finally deployed. Um, and in steps two, the uh, publication takes place and in step three, the deployment pipeline is triggered. So the first, uh, at first, there's the source code repository. This is another OCI console uh, view on the Git repository, the fully managed Git repository that contains, in this case, the myserver.go file. Uh, that's my Go application that handles the HTTP requests and the build spec.yaml. And that's the file that contains the instructions for the build server. Here's the build pipeline. Three stages, the managed build stage, the publish artifact stage, and the trigger deployment pipeline stage, and also a parameter. And in, uh, in this case, I specify that the version I want to create, the my server version, is 4.10. Uh, this will be used when publishing the artifact and also when triggering the deployment pipeline. Here's the definition of the managed build stage. Uh, it refers to the build specification.yaml file, the build-spec.yaml file uh, that's in my source code repository. That's the file the build server should execute. And I could only select the currently available build server image, which is fine for my purpose, by the way. Um, and I've also specified what is the source, uh, the source code repository uh, from which this, uh, this build should get its sources. So that's defined here. A very brief look at the build specification. So this is the build spec.yaml file. It's a fairly simple file in which we specify 
first of all, the environment variables that should be set up and the values of these environment variables can be derived from the parameters defined against um, the build pipeline uh, and also against uh, the vault. And here are the individual steps that we want the, uh, the build pipeline to go through. So in this case, uh, a tool is installed and then a number of build and lint uh, code QA and test steps are executed. Then the executable is built. This results in an executable file. And then um, the one but, but last step creates an archive and the archive contains the executable, the binary ex executable and the static uh, files that are in the directory website. And this final archive, uh, that's defined as an output from the build stage. And this output is available for additional steps in the build pipeline. This output can then be published as an artifact and that artifact can be deployed by the deployment pipeline. So here's the output again. And in the publish artifact stage, the second stage in the build pipeline, uh, I refer to this output. And I also, uh, I also in, uh, indicate that this particular output should be published as an artifact. And this artifact is called myserver.zip and it's a version is derived from a parameter, from the parameter myserver underscore version. And we already know that this parameter is defined in the build pipeline and it has been set to a default value of 4.10. Well, then the third step is trigger the deployment pipeline. Um, and I have to specify the deployment pipeline that I want to trigger. And then the UI shows me um, which parameters are defined for the deployment pipeline and any parameter in the deployment pipeline that has the same name as a parameter in the build pipeline will get its value from the build pipeline parameter. So in this case, my server underscore version is a parameter in the deployment pipeline. Its value is set default to 4.9. But because the value in the build pipeline for a, a parameter of the same name is set to 4.10, when the deployment pipeline runs, it will also use a value of 4.10. So we run the build pipeline. And when we trigger the build pipeline, the first thing it will do is get the sources. It will build the sources into the zip file. The zip file gets published into the generic artifact registry with a, um, a version tag of 4.10. And then the deployment pipeline is triggered and it will do its thing. And we know its thing is to take the artifact, install it on the VM, extract the files and run the application. And then we can send HTTP requests again to that VM. So this is what we see when we have just started the build pipeline. We will wait for a little while until build server is acquired. Uh, and then when the, uh, when the build pipeline is complete, the output will look something like this. And of course, we are looking for the green check marks. After the second stage, a new artifact is published in the artifact registry. So instead of manually uploading the new zip file, the zip file was published there by the build pipeline. And after the third step, the deployment pipeline has run and it has run with a parameter value of 4.10 for parameter myserver.version. And uh, again, we are looking for the green check marks. Um, some words on the managed build stage. I'm, 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 uh, I'm almost done, by the way. I, uh, I realize that we are at the end of the session. Um, a new service that was uh, re um, announced uh, only earlier uh, this month is called the Application Dependency Management Service, or OCI, and it can be used to analyze vulnerabilities in any application. And you can invoke this service from um, a managed build stage. And when vulnerabilities are found, that can be a reason for uh, abandoning um, the build. Uh, the managed build stage can build container images. I mentioned that before. You can run anything you like as part of the build. So any, uh, any Linux shell command can be executed. 
So you can use a build pipeline, not just for building applications into deployable packages, but also, for example, to perform infrastructure as code commands. Uh, a build pipeline can, can contain multiple manage, managed build stages. Um, so you could have reusable managed build stages or re reusable build specification files that you use in different build pipelines. Well, maybe that goes a little bit too far for today's session. Finally, and this is the last slide. Uh, automation is super important. And I don't have to convince you of that, I hope. But automation allows us to make things more proven, repeatable, um, triggered uh, in a chain of, of actions, more secure. Um, so we can perform actions that we don't have to grant permissions for to humans. Uh, it can all be um, securely tightened uh, under the wraps uh, inside OCI. Um, by automation, we can perform things faster. Well, maybe not always faster, but at least we can perform them at any time. And we don't have humans available or even uh, involved. And of course, the skills of the people operating the pipelines um, can be far less if the pipeline does everything automatically. The new OCI DevOps service or the fairly new OCI DevOps service provides automation, automation of the build of software into deployable packages uh, and also of the deployment of these packages to various OCI runtime platforms, the OPE um, functions uh, and compute instances. The OCI DevOps service is embedded in OCI, which means that you get all these generic facilities uh, out of the box in a fully integrated like IAM, like logging, like events that can be monitored for and uh, on which uh, notifications can be subscribed, the code repository, Git uh, compliant, and the artifact registry. And of course, the tools that you can use against any OCI resource can also be used against the OCI DevOps resources. It's a fairly young service and it's quickly growing the functionality. Uh, it's largely free and where it's not free, it's very cheap. So there's really nothing to stop you from using it, I would say. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I hope it was useful. And I hope that one day in the near future, we can meet again. Thank you very much. And now I'm going over to check if there's any questions. Hi, Lucas. Thank you so much. Excellent session as always. Just waiting to see if anyone has any questions from here and just waiting from the user groups to let me know by messenger if there's any questions by the Facebook side. Just giving a second. And uh, looks like there's no questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions to Lucas later or don't want to do that in a public uh, space, in the PowerPoint on the screen, you can see his email and also his LinkedIn and also his Twitter uh, information. You can always ask and contact Lucas offline uh, directly to this contact information. If you're yeah. watching in the replays, uh, during uh, uh, the event, you also can contact Lucas offline in the same way. In that case, thank you so much, Lucas, for giving your sharing your time with the community in the Asia PAC globally and sharing uh, your knowledge with everyone around the world. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for organizing this event. Thank you so much, Lucas. Thank you so much, everyone. This We have one more session tonight, today. And then we have six more tomorrow. Please enjoy the, the rest of the conference and take care and be safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.